Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Oh my gosh, what an awesome day this is. I can't wait to just be with whomever is going to be with us on live here or through the replay. Um, we are going to be sharing, I'm not sure why I'm saying we, I'm going to be sharing a message from God and I'm calling it Revelations in Ruth, Discovering God's Vast Love for You. And I see some of my VIPs already here. Hello, Brandy, Kathy, Kaylee. Love you guys. Love all of you, actually. Um, and so, Revelations in Ruth. This is such an amazing, um, gosh, such an amazing message that, Alicia, hi! I'm so glad you came. Okay, I'm going to have to stop saying hi to everybody or else I'll probably just be, uh, Nicole. Okay. That's enough. Love you guys so much. Ava. Oh my gosh. My favorite people are with me. Okay. All right. Let's get started. I have so much to cover that I, um, I need to get going cause I don't want this to be two hours long, but it might be an hour. I'm going to try pray for me that we get through this quickly, but that the Holy spirit is with us. So I'm actually going to start by praying. Holy spirit. You are our guide. You are our person that is in us and that operates. So I just speak over this broadcast that it reaches every single person it needs to reach, that it touches every single heart that you want to touch, that it heals every single wound that you want it to heal. And this revelation will just come alive in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So, uh, this is a story based in the book of Ruth and what I am going to do is I'm actually going to read some of the story of Ruth straight out of the Bible. And I'm going to kind of commentate it a little bit, but at the end, so we have to get grounded in the story first. And then at the end, I'm going to give you 20 revelations that God has shared to me that blessed my soul and honestly keeps blessing my soul. Um, and this was like, gosh, I think this started about three weeks ago that God gave me this revelation and it just continues to go and go and expand. So at the end, um, if you have to pop off because you've got to go somewhere, come back and finish with the replay because there's so many incredible things that I know that God wants to share with you today that are going to bless you. I believe this message he's giving me to share is literally for every person. There is something in this message for you, no matter what on earth you're going through. And so, um, let's get started. Um, I do want to tell you first that, um, kind of a funny thing. We all know that God, anybody who follows God knows God is, God is funny. He, he created humor. Um, and honestly, I got to my Bible reading plan, um, which was the book of Ruth. I don't know, a month ago, maybe, maybe two months ago. And I'm just going to be honest, I dragged my feet. I didn't want to start reading it because I've been a Christian um, pretty much all my life. And I just felt like I just wasn't into it. I'm just going to be honest. I felt like I don't know what I'm going to learn new from this, which is really prideful of me. I understand that now. Um, and God totally hit me upside the head in the best of ways with this revelation when I did finally start reading. Um, but it is kind of funny and like a, a hot little tip that sometimes when you don't want to do something godly, just watch out. That's usually the enemy trying to keep you from something that God has for you. So, um, once I start, started reading, God just started pa pow, pa pow, pa pow. It, it, this story came alive to me unlike it's ever come alive to me. And I don't even know how many times I've read the story of Ruth in my life. So, um, it's going to happen for you today as well. And Brandy, I don't have a handout, but I can create one later and give it to you. But, oh, I know what I was going to say. Thank you, Brandy, for mentioning that because... One of the things I wanted to mention is there will be, like I said, 20 different revelations. And I know that it, one of them at least is going to hit each and every one of you who watches this broadcast. So if, and I'm going to have to go through kind of quick because there's just so much. So if you want, grab a notepad and a pen, just so you can jot the one down that, that, that you feel like is going to be so helpful for you. Um, because there's so many and you might just want to make some notes. You don't need to, but if you want to. Okay. So, um, I just want to tell you, uh, before we start actually reading, I'm going to recap actually part of it first, and then we're going to get into the actual story. But I just want to tell you, God did an incredible healing work in my heart. I would say he started a healing work in my heart through this revelation. And so I'm going to tell you a tiny bit more about that at the end, but just know that this is 
Oftentimes God gives us a message for ourselves and then sometimes he wants us to share the, the message with others because it's not just for ourselves. So I am being obedient to share this because I know that it's going to bless others. So let's just get right into it. So the book of Ruth is only four, chap or four, yeah, four chapters. It's actually really quick, but I, I'm not going to read the first chapter. I'm going to start reading in the second chapter. And what I want to do is just recap for you um, the first chapter. So basically the book of Ruth is about predominantly Ruth, but it starts with Naomi. So there's a woman named Naomi. She was married to a man named Elimelech and she and Elimelech um, were living in Judah. They're Israelites and there was a famine in the land and they decided to travel with their two sons to Moab, which was an enemy nation. Um, and the, the, the land was more fertile in that day and they decided to go there. Obviously they did. They were able to live there peacefully. They must have assimilated somewhat with uh, the Moabites because both of Naomi and, and Elimelech's sons actually married Moabite women. And one of the sons married Ruth. Okay, so that's where the story kind of, uh, kind of starts. That's where we get Ruth. So Ruth is Naomi's daughter-in-law, okay? Naomi and Elimelech's daughter-in-law. And what ends up happening is, we don't have too much of a timeline here, but when they're in Moab, so all of them, Naomi, Elimelech, the two sons and uh, their two wives, everything seems to be fine except Elimelech dies and then the two sons die. So everyone from Naomi's literal closest part of her family dies. So all the men in her family, and she's only left with her two daughter-in-laws. And they actually belong to the enemy nation that they're living in, the, in, to Moab. So basically what ends up happening is Naomi finds out that back in Judah, everything is fine. The, the, the land is producing now. So she feels like she's called to go back to Judah which makes sense because that's where she's from and that's her heritage. But now she's got these two daughter-in-laws and she basically says to them, hey, daughters, don't come with me. Um, she was old um, and she says, I'm not gonna get married again and I'm definitely not gonna have sons and back in that tradition in those days, um, you know, she could have actually had another two sons and they could have gotten married just to keep the family name. I know it sounds weird to us now, but that's some of the things that they did back then and it made sense culturally. But she's like, I'm too old for that. So um, don't come with me, stay with your families in Moab. You're from Moab, you have families here, you can be provided for here. And back in those days, especially in the Israelite culture, um, the socioeconomic system was kind of, it hinged on the patriarch and the men in the family. And there's nothing right or wrong with that. That's just how it worked back then. And so really it's not to say that women, women couldn't, you know, have jobs and couldn't own property, but predominantly everything was, was hinged from the, the men in the family. So Naomi knew that she was going back and if she's old enough, she may not have any the Bible doesn't say specifically, but we don't think she has any relatives back in Israel. She probably has friends, but we know she has friends because we read on and find that out. But so she's going back with nothing except just her, her heritage of, of the Israelite nation that she's from. Whereas the two um, daughters-in-law, they can stay with their family. So what ends up happening is one of the daughters-in-law does stay in Moab, but Ruth decides kind of against all let's even call it common sense. She decides, and I, I believe she had a call from the living God, and the Bible doesn't say that, but I believe there was something happening there that was more spiritual. She believes that she's supposed to go with Naomi back to Israel. And so she does that. And um, she actually pledges herself to Naomi, which is phenomenal. She actually says, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but she says, your God is gonna be my God which basically means she converted, right? She's like, I'm gonna put away my, my Moabite gods and I'm going to, I'm gonna take on your God, the God of Israel. That will be my God because that is your God and I'm gonna go live in now what is gonna be her enemy territory, okay? Cause she's been living her whole life in Moab, but now she's gonna go into Israel. Well, that's enemy territory she has never lived in before. This is pretty, I don't wanna say risky necessarily, but there could have been elements of risk here because she doesn't have the protection of any men because her husband and her father-in-law have now died. Her brother-in-law has died, but she's pledging to go back with Naomi who has nothing. We'll find out she has one thing, but um, 
It's not something that's that significant necessarily. Um, and it's certainly not something that's going to protect Ruth. But Ruth makes this just unbelievable decision to go follow Naomi. So that's where we're going to pick up in chapter two. And I'm actually going to read through chapters uh, two, three, and a little bit of chapter four. And I'm going to insert some of my own um, commentary here just to help us kind of as we're setting up for these revelations that God had had distilled down for me. Um, you actually are probably going to start figuring out some of them as we read, which is going to be so fun um, that God's going to illuminate, uh, illuminate his word for you. And so um, I'm going to give a couple of, of, of side notes as we go along that will just kind of cement these revel revelations as a foundation. So chapter two. Now, Naomi. Okay, they're, they've just returned back to Israel, to Judah. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side. He was a prominent man of noble character from Elimelech, that's Naomi's deceased husband, from Elimelech's family. His name was Boaz. Ruth, okay, Naomi's daughter-in-law, the Moabitess asked Naomi, will you let me go into the fields and gather fallen grain behind someone with whom I find favor? And I literally have to stop already and explain a little bit about this. It's not that you guys can't figure out what's happening. It's just there's some stuff that's underlying here and that is um, deals with the customs of their culture in that day and age and for Israelites. So basically, number one thing that Ruth is having to do is she's understanding her place as a foreigner. So Ruth, remember, she's from Moab. She's in Israel now. She has nothing. Because she has no husband, she has no father-in-law, she has nothing. So she realizes, okay, according to custer, uh, custom and culture, I'm, I'm nothing. Now, we know that's not true because she's, she's loved and she's cherished, but she's nothing in terms of like culture, kind of. Um, and so Ruth realizes, I bring nothing to the table. That's a better way of saying it. She's not nothing, but she kind of has nothing to bring to the table. She certainly does not have a job. There's no way to get a job. Um, women typically, not, not too many women had to work necessarily unless they worked within their husband and their family's um, economic system, whatever that was, a lot of it was agricultural back then. So she understands and humbles herself and says, I know I'm a foreigner. And what she understood and somehow she, she picked this up is that back in those days when there were uh, obviously an agricultural community, there were many, many fields. And as, as a part of Levitical law, there was a, um, a, a provision that God made for poor people. And, and, and I venture to say all Israelites um, prescribed and followed this law that said if you have a field, you have a plot of land that you're that you're producing some kind of produce from, you need to hold back a portion. Um, I believe it was about 10 percent of that field, meaning you don't glean, you don't harvest about 10 percent because you leave that part of the field for anyone in the community who is poor. Now that's typically people who are not foreigners, right? That's people in the Israelite community who are poor. And that is the way that they, one of the ways that they were taking care of their citizens who were poor. And that was just customary. So Ruth finds out about this, but she realizes, okay, I'm a foreigner. So I'm not even sure if anyone's gonna let me do this. Yes, I'm poor, so I do fit that description. Number two though, I'm a, a foreigner. And are they going, are any of these landowners even gonna allow me to glean because Naomi and I have no way to make money right now. We have no way to, to eat. I mean, except by the kindness and generos generosity of others, perhaps. But she's like, we really have no way of, of, of doing anything. We, we've got to be able to fend for ourselves in some way. So she knows that if she's going to have a chance to glean from a field, it's going to have to be from someone, like the scripture says right here, that she finds favor with. Okay, remember she's a foreigner. I'm going to just drill a few things in so that you're like, you get it when we get to the part of the revelations. So again, she says, will you let me, she's under Naomi's authority. She submitted herself to Naomi. Will you let me go in the fields and gather fallen grain behind someone with whom I find favor? Naomi answers her and says, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth left and entered the field to gather grain behind the harvesters. The harvesters were the employees of the field owner. Now, I love this next verse. She happened to be in the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was from Elimelech, her father-in-law's family. Okay, now we got to stop again. Um, do, does anything do, does, does God do anything by chance or happenstance? Does God just accidentally do things? Anybody, anybody? <laughs> I mean, he literally does nothing 
by accident ever. Everything God does is so intentional and so purposeful. And that's the first thing we need to understand about God. Now the Bible cracks me up here because it says she happened to be. So what do we know as believers? Well, God led her into that field, obviously, as we're going to see later. God led her into that field. And so, I'm sorry, I just, my screen went dark, so I wanted to make sure I didn't lose anybody here, but God led her into that field. He, she didn't really just happen to be there, right? The Lord happened to put her there. Okay, so later, now this is Boaz's field. When Boaz arrived back from Bethlehem, he was obviously doing some kind of work. He said to his harvesters, the Lord be with you. And the Lord bless you, they replied. So obviously they have a good relationship. Boaz then asked his servant who was in charge of the harvester. So this is the main guy who runs everything. Whose young woman is this? Okay, now that sounds like a really weird question. It's kind of like, who does she belong to? But again, remember in society back then, women, you know, you, you could say whose because who does she belong to? Who is she affiliated with as a family? It doesn't mean she was owned by a man, but that's just the way that, that they put it. Who, who, he's really asking which family, who's her husband kind of he's asking, like who does she belong to? And uh, the servant answered, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the territory of Moab. She asked us, will you let me gather fallen grain from among the bundles behind the harvesters? And she came and has been on her feet since early morning, except that she rested a little in the shelter. Okay, so let's stop right there and just give you a little bit of um, context about harvesting back then because I had to kind of look some things up. So now in our modern day agriculture, you know, har I don't know how long harvesting takes. I assume it's not all that long, but back then, especially for this type of harvest, it was about three months long and it was sun up to sundown that you would be harvesting. So we know that they just said that she started early morning, that was probably sun up, and we don't know what time it is now, but Boaz is kind of done with his work, so we're assuming it's like towards the end of the day, right? And she's just only rested a little bit. So what is this saying to us about Ruth? What this is saying is that Ruth is a hard, hard worker. She is not taking anything for granted. She is, obviously she asked if she could be in this field she found favor with them to be able to, you know, glean in this field. And she's going to show them, I am not going to, uh, I'm going to carry my own weight. I'm not going to, I'm not going to act entitled here. And so then Boaz goes over to Ruth and says, listen, my daughter, don't go and gather grain in another field and don't leave my field basically, but stay here close to my female servants see which field he he obviously owned multiple fields see which field they're harvesting and follow them haven't i ordered the young men not to touch you i'm going to come back to that in a minute when you are thirsty go and drink from the jars the young men have filled there's so much in this passage of scripture of what he says and before we go on i just have to illuminate a little bit of this so we see honestly how kind he is first of all Boaz has just found out, or he already knew, and it's been confirmed that she's this foreigner from an enemy nation. And he literally calls her a daughter. Well, she's not really a daughter, right? She's a foreigner. That's, the mo that's one of the kindest things he could say to her. Listen, my daughter also, by the way, P.S., Many scholars say that Boaz was around 80 years old, and Ruth at this time was around 40 years old. So, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, age difference wise that makes a lot of sense he would call her a daughter and not like sister so just keep that age difference in mind um he 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 says stay stay for the next three months and glean from me now listen other harvesters or or, or owners of these fields might have been like hey you can be here one or two days but i'm kicking you out i don't know we, we didn't live back then but she's a foreigner remember and she's not from a friendly nation so i can just assume here that not many people would have been as kind as Boaz, immediately as kind. This is day one that she's there. And he says, hey, I want you to go with my female servants. I don't want you worrying. I've told my male servants, they are not to lay a finger on you. You go with my female servants and you're gonna be fine and you're gonna be safe and you're gonna actually have a little community bonus. And he then goes one step further and says, when you're thirsty, you can drink of the water that we have, that I've provided. And 
I can only imagine in that dry, arid, hot, sun-drenched desert that they were living in back then, sun up to sundown, how thirsty she might have been. And back then, I mean, you, you usually would get uh, water from wells. How is she going to carry? I would be needing to drink two gallons of water if I or more if I'm doing that job for that many hours in that kind of you know heat or whatever. And it's not like Ruth could just you know bust out a bunch of water. That was such an incredibly kind thing to do and to provide for Ruth. And Ruth knows it because the ne very next scripture or verse says she fell face down. Just watch her humility. It blesses my soul. She bowed to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor with you so that you notice me? Am I not a foreigner? Although I am a foreigner. She's literally saying to him, I don't deserve any of this. I, I don't deserve any of this. You are showing me favor and mercy. I don't deserve it. And I mean, what a sweetheart. What a sweet heart she has. And it is just a wonderful um, response to his kindness and generosity. But Boaz answers her and says, everything you have done for your mother-in-law since your husband's death has been fully reported to me. Well, okay, that's interesting. You know, somehow he's gotten a full report. And this is not like the ladies gossiping in the town. He's gotten a full report. How do you think he got that? I mean, I wonder who had something to do with that. So everything has been fully reported to me, how you left your father and mother and your native land and how you came to a people you didn't previously know. And now this is the kicker. He says, he gives her two blessings in a row. May the Lord reward you for what you've done and may you receive a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Now remember, what is the, the wings that she has come under refuge? He's Boaz is referring to the Lord, and in scriptures we we didn't in, in chapter one we we missed this part. Um, but she literally says she's going to put um, her her she's going to go under Naomi's wings for refuge. And I could be getting that wrong. I have to look back. But she, but this has been brought up already um, before. So she's she's putting her wings under um, under others for for refuge. And he says the Lord the Lord. Oh, I take that all back. One second. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for correcting me. Um, she had converted. We remember she had converted to their culture, to their God, to the to Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so basically that's like saying, you know, she's come under. Boaz says, I know you've converted because, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you a full reward from the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you've come for refuge. So he's basically saying, um, you serve our Lord God and you will receive this full reward. I mean, I just have to stop for a second and just be like, what favor she found with Boaz and how God rewarded her faithfulness with this kind, generous man. It is so unbelievable. So let's keep reading to see what happens because it's so, so good. My Lord, she says, she's calling, she's lit again. She's, she's a servant. She's looking up to him with honor. My Lord, I have found favor with you for you have comforted and encouraged your servant. Although I am not like one of your female servants. Again, here she is again, you guys no, take notice of this again. She's like, I'm not worthy. I am humble. I am nothing. And you are blessing me, comforting me and encouraging me. Those are pretty, those are pretty bold words. Um, and it just speaks to his absolute heart for her that we know he, or any other landowner probably was not this kind and generous to just everybody. Now, maybe Boaz was because he had such an incredible reputation. But we're also starting to see here some hints of maybe Boaz being possibly a little bit taken by Ruth. She's 40 years younger-ish. And um, other, other scholars say, I don't know where they get this from, but they think that Ruth was very beautiful. Um, regardless, we're starting to see like this is abnormal guys this is an abnormal level of kindness and generosity keep that in mind because boaz in the bible represents something greater to us okay abnormal comfort abnormal encouragement abnormal kindness and generosity and here go he just goes on and on at mealtime boaz told her come over here and have some bread and dip it in the vinegar sauce okay he's inviting her to dinner okay again this is not normal people this is not normal okay the meals that were for that that, that, that he's preparing or he's not really preparing but his servants are preparing are for his employees and his family now we know we think Boaz doesn't actually have a family because the actual scriptures don't uh, say he does. 
But if he was a landowner with a family and whatnot, these meals would be for his family and his um, workers, not for the poor in the community, right? Okay, the, the Levitical law did not make provision for, you know, the poor people to go beyond gleaning in the field to have dinner with everybody. But Boaz invites her to his table and it like is so generous. Oh, take some bread, dip it in the vinegar sauce. So she sat beside the harvesters, see her heart. She's, she's sitting beside the workers. She views herself as a servant and he offers her again. He's offering her more food, roasted grain. I just love this so much. I mean, he can't, let's just be honest. He can't take his eyes off her. She ate and was satisfied and had some left over. So she's satisfied. We're going to come back to that word in the revelations. And she had some left over when she got up to gather grain, the grain that she, you know, had already, um, she's going to pick it up and take it home. Now Boaz ordered his young men, let her even gather grain among the bundles and don't humiliate her, pull out some stalks from the bundles for her and leave them for her to gather. Don't rebuke her. Now I have to say this about this, uh, passage here. Okay, it's not normal, again, for uh, you, you, the, the, the Levitical law made the provision for the portions of the field to be left unharvested so the poor people could go and, and harvest that themselves. The provision did not say, oh, take from your bundles that you've already bundled up, the stalks, the, the wheat, the barley, take some out and, and you know, um, conspicuously like, oops, drop it over there for a poor person. Now, you know, it's not to say that they couldn't do that, but that just wasn't typical. So Boaz is ordering them to do that. But I love this next part where he orders them, do not humiliate her. Do not rebuke her. She's a foreigner. She doesn't deserve any of this. And, and Boaz knows it. Boaz knows like I'm giving her extra, extra, extra. And he knows it. And he knows they're going to probably be like, what are you doing boss? <sighs> like why has she found so much favor? But he, he like preempts them. And he's like, don't you even, don't you even don't humiliate her. Do not rebuke her. And so look, we're going to come back to that in the revelations too. It's so good. So good. Ruth then gathered grain in the field until evening. Oh, I'm sorry. Their meal must've been earlier. I forgot about that. She beat out what she had gathered and it was about 26 quarts of barley. This woman is like a hustler. She picked up the grain and went into the town where her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. She brought out what she had left over from her meal. So Boaz lets her take leftovers back to Naomi and she gave it to Naomi. Her mother-in-law said to her, where, I'm going to add some commentary, where on earth did you gather barley today? Where did you work? She's like, this is not normal. It's very clear to Naomi, who's an Israelite, who is very um, in tune with the customs and the culture. She's like, something weird happened today. I don't know how this happened. Where, where did this happen at? May the Lord bless the man who noticed you. And keep that word in mind. Notice, notice. Ruth told her mother-in-law whom she had worked with, the man, the name of the man I work with today is Boaz. Then Naomi says to her, may the Lord bless him because he has not abandoned his kindness to the living or the dead. Now she's referring to their, the, men, the men of the house that have passed. Naomi continued, this man is a close relative. He is one of our family redeemers. Okay. So those of you who have been Christians a long time, I'm sure you've heard about this, but for those of you who have not, you don't understand this, I want to tell you what this is. Again, in Levitical law, so a family or kinsman redeemer was a um, person with a responsibility in the family that if a, a woman in the family had a husband who passed on before there were any heirs born, then the next closest male kin would then come uh, alongside take her in and I know it seems strange to us we don't do stuff like this in our culture nowadays but this there were provisions for this for good reason back then he would take her in have a child with her to carry on the deceased man's name okay so that that lineage could carry on and this was called a family redeemer and there were other duties involved in um, being a family redeemer not just that um, but we don't need to go into all that at this point the most important part that you understand is this was normal and cultural because it was very important for you know, God said in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. Um, it was very important for Israelite culture for their names to be carried on and their clans and their generations to continue. And that can't happen when a man passes away before he, um, before he gives birth to an heir. So 
Naomi's telling Ruth, hey, you might not know this about our custom. And she's kind of educating her here. This man is a redeemer for our family. So Ruth says, um, he also told me to stay with my young men until they have finished all my harvest. So Bo Boaz has gone to the ultimate. We just talked about this a second ago, but this is when she's revealing to Naomi. He said, stay with me for the whole harvest. And so Naomi says, my daughter, it is good for you to work with his female servants so that nothing will happen to you in another field. So she's just, she's just confirming Boaz is a man of integrity that he is keeping her safe. And so she says, okay, it says Ruth stayed close to Boaz's female servants and gathered grain until the barley and wheat harvest were finished. And she lived, of course, continued living with her mother-in-law. Okay, so chapter three, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi said to her, my daughter, shouldn't I find rest for you so that you will be taken care of? Okay, because yes, she can keep gleaning, but this is not like a real job. This is not something, perhaps since Boaz was so incredibly generous, she could sell a lot of this grain that she gleaned and she could actually make a living, but um, it would be a little bit risky. It's not, it's not like a customary thing. Um, and so she's, Naomi really wants to get Ruth taken care of, which shows the heart of Naomi, of course. And so she says, now isn't Boaz our relative? Haven't you been working with his female servants? This evening, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Well, how did she know that? Well, she is very familiar with customs there. And so she knows that once the harvest is finished, now it all has to be threshed out and winnowed, whatever that means. We, we, don't, we don't know, <laughs> but it's to take and, and process the grain and the barley. And um, that's the very next thing that happens after they actually harvest it. So she, it's not that she's like got some gossip from the town. It's that she understands what the next step is here. So she says, wash, put on perfumed oil and wear your best clothes. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let the man, she's talking about Boaz, know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, notice the place where he's lying, go in and uncover his feet and lie down. Then he will explain to you what you should do. Okay, now this is where people get really mixed up because a lot of people misunderstand this because they don't understand the customs of the culture back then. And they think that Naomi was trying to prostitute Ruth to Boaz or trick him into sleeping with her and then he would have to marry her, blah, 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 blah. That is not at all what was going on here. Um, and let me break down a couple points for you, just really quickly. Remember they're harvesting, this is like the last day, and she's worked all day, so has Boaz, whatever he's done, so have the male servants. Everybody is hot, sweaty, and let's just extrapolate, pretty stinky. I'm not sure if they had deodorant back then. I'm gonna guess they used stuff, but I don't know. I would be stinky even after all that if I had three applications of deodorant on. What Naomi is saying to do is to clean herself up and make herself presentable in a position of respect and honor for what she's about to go do um, to present herself to Boaz, okay? This is coming from a place of respect and honor. Perfumed oil was different back then. Um, we, in our culture, we, we kind of use it to smell good, attract people. Back then, that wasn't the whole usage of it. It was, it, oil was, we, we know, anointing oil. So don't don't misunderstand this passage here and 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 extrapolate something that's happening that's not um she says wear your best clothes make yourself presentable clean yourself up because you're about to ask him to do something huge and so the the neck the in that also i wanted to tell you where when she says to notice where he lays down and don't let him know kind of sneak in that's also people think is ridiculous but there's a reason for it um because Naomi wants him to uncover his feet without him knowing. If he was awake, she can't really do that. And he would be like, what are you doing? Um, so he has to not know what's happening. The reason Naomi tells him to uncover his feet is again, a custom. So basically when a kinsman or family redeemer or any man takes on a woman in the Israelite culture, um, even part of the marriage ceremony, they would put part of their garment over the woman. And that was a symbol of saying, I now cover you and protect you and provide for you. You are under my covering. So Naomi, because Ruth doesn't understand these customs, she doesn't know, Naomi's instructing her, here's what to do, because you're going to be asking him to take you on under his covering, okay? So it's all cu custom driven. This has nothing to do with anything um, insidious or manipulative whatsoever. It's honor and respect and culture. 
which is actually uh, the complete opposite of what some people think here. So then remember she says, Ruth, he's gonna tell you what to do. Okay, so Ruth has no idea what he's gonna say. This is pretty, I mean, if I'm Ruth, let's just be honest, I I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm really uncomfortable here because I'm going to go down here in the dark, sneak in, uncover some guy's feet, and then lay there while he's sleeping till he notices me. I don't know how long that's going to be. I'm going to be like trembling with fear because I don't know what he's going to do. Ru Naomi didn't tell me what he's going to say or do. He's just She just said he's going to tell me. I mean, I would, I would not have left Naomi before I may force her to tell me, well, what, what's going to happen next? No, she has complete faith that... She's just got to follow these instructions. And I love that. I love that Ruth has no idea what's going to happen. And she goes with it. Oh, such a good blessing for us to remember to be a little bit like Ruth. And so let's catch up here. Ruth says to her, I will do everything you say. She went down to the threshing floor, did everything Naomi charged her to do. After Boaz ate, drank, and was in good spirits, does not mean he was drunk. He was just in good spirits. Um, he went to lie down at the end of the pile of barley. Oh, by the way, why was he laying down and not sleeping at his house? Because if he didn't go protect his harvest, it would be um, stolen and robbed and it would not, I mean, he's got to protect his harvest. That is exactly what um, everyone had to do you know, right after they, they harvested. They've got to protect it. So he's going to sleep there to protect it. So he's, he's sleeping by the end. She comes secretly, uncovers his feet, and lays down. At midnight, okay, so she was there for a while. We don't know what time she came, but she was there for a while, guys, trembling, probably with fear, if it was me. Um, at midnight, Boaz was startled, turned over, and there lying at his feet was a woman, and he asks, who are you? Okay, why did he not know who she was? He knows who Ruth is. Well, the reason is it's pitch black, guys. Um, we don't have lights, electricity back then. I'm sure he didn't have a candle burning in the midst of his barley harvest. That would possibly put the whole thing at risk. It's dark, everybody. And how did he know that she was a woman? Well, she smelled pretty good. And anybody else probably wouldn't have gone to that length to be there, even if it was a female servant. And I forgot to tell you this awesome part. Um, the reason Naomi said to lay at his feet is because that is something that servants did back in the day. They would go lay at their master's feet. That was the posture they were to take so that they would be there at their master's feet ready for whatever command or whatever that master needed. So Naomi says to Ruth, you go lay there as a servant. Okay, that's what you're laying there as, not a prostitute or someone, some hussy or manipulator. You're laying there as a servant. And so any other servant that's laying there, you guys, is not going to have perfume on. They probably wouldn't have taken a bath. I mean, they didn't even take a bath, I don't think, every day back then because where, where's, the, where's the shower at? I don't know. Um, so he knows she's a woman, you guys. It's pretty easy to, to uh, figure that out from the perfume. And it, he can tell. He can tell. But he can't really see. So she says, I am Ruth, your servant. So again, here she is saying, I'm your servant. Take me under your wing. This is the second part that I got a little mixed up earlier. This is where she says, take me under your wing. I'm under the Father Almighty's wing, but take me under your wing, for you are a family redeemer. And this next um, passage of scripture just knocks my socks off. He says, we don't know, first of all, what he's going to do. He could like kick her out. He could chastise her, rebuke her, be like, woman, you are risking my reputation. I am a man of noble character and I am prominent in this community. You come in here, if someone got the wrong idea, he could literally have gone off on her, you guys. And he doesn't, he doesn't, she doesn't know what he's gonna do though. So again, she's worried maybe. He says this, may the Lord bless you, my daughter. You have shown me more kindness now than before. Huh, I wonder why. Because you have not pursued younger men, whether rich or poor. Remember the age difference? He's like, you, he's like, why are you picking me? You're so kind. I'm 80. Why are you picking me? Wow. He's like knocked off his rocker here. He says, now don't be afraid. So she must have been afraid. My daughter, I will do for you whatever you say. Well, those are big words. Since all the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Now it's, it's spread, you guys, what Ruth is really like. It has spread all the people in my town know. Yes, it is true that I am a family redeemer. And here comes the twist. But there is a redeemer closer than I. Oh, no. Stay here tonight because it's midnight, remember? It's middle of the night. He does not want her leaving and potentially getting raped or 
who knows what, this is right after harvest season. There are people out crouching. So he's like, I'm protecting you. Stay here the rest of the night. In the morning, if this other redeemer wants you and to redeem you, it's good. Now, why would he say that? If you un don't understand, it makes no sense. Well, the reason he's saying it's good if this first person in line redeems you is because he's a man of honor. Oh my gosh, look at his heart. He says, hey, it's good. It's good if this other guy is going to redeem you because it's his rightful place. And he's ahead of me. Oh, the heart. Let him redeem you if he says so. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, as the Lord lives, I will. He's pledging to her. Now lie down until morning. So she lay down at his feet until morning, but got up while it was still dark. And then Boaz said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. Again, this is a protective comment, not a rebuke. He's just like, I don't want anyone spreading nasty rumors that are not accurate about you or me. But I think he really is talking about her. He's more concerned about her than him at this point. Um, and he told Ruth, bring me your shawl, the one that you're wearing, hold it out. It's like an apron. So she's holding out her apron. And he shoveled six measures of barley into her shawl and she went into the town. What on earth? I think this is like a deposit. And we'll see in a second, it's, it's a, it is for some other reason too, but I truly think this is like a deposit on his word. He does not have to give her one thing, not one thing. They, he, they're not betrothed yet. He has no responsibility for her. Um, he doesn't have to give her anything, but he does not send her away without, without a, another blessing. This man, oh, okay. So she goes to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who I'm gonna just change the words here and be like, what on earth happened, daughter? What, what's going on? I can't wait to hear. I mean, she's literally like, yeah, I've been dying. I, I didn't sleep a wink. Now, I know I added a lot there, but wouldn't you be if you were Naomi? Like, what's going on? What's the status? Then Ruth told her everything the man had done for her. She said, he gave me these six measures of barley because he said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed because he's thinking of more than himself and he's thinking of more than Ruth. He's thinking of Naomi too. You guys, he's willing to take on Naomi too. I mean, he's such a generous, kind man that he, it, this is not just about him. He wants to do the best for everyone, even down the line. So Naomi says, my daughter, Wait until you find out how things go, for this man is not going to rest unless he resolves this today. She's basically telling him, and I know, I know, there's no exact scriptural evidence, but I believe the Holy Spirit is okay with me saying this. He's in love, and he's not going to waste one minute to get your hand. He's going to do everything he can do to settle this matter, because he, ooh, he's got a heart for you. And so uh, what ends up happening, I got to read you just this one, uh, one part of, of chapter four. Boaz goes down to the gate of the town. That's because all business and all uh, prominent matters were taken care of at the gate back in those days. So he sits down and he waits and soon the family redeemer comes. I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So he says, oh, family redeemer that's closer than me, come sit down. He grabs some elders and witnesses. That's how they did it back then. And he says, Naomi who has returned from the territory of Moab, is selling the portion of the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. Not his exact brother. This is like calling Father Abraham. Well, he's not my father, but he's like the father of the father of the father of the father. So we don't, the, the scholars say it's, they're not actually brothers, but this is a common term to say he's our close kin. Okay, so this Naomi and the field that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should inform you Buy it back in the presence of those seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want to redeem it, do it. He's basically saying, come on, this is your chance, dude. But if you do not want to redeem it, tell me because I will. There's nobody else next but me. And he goes, oh yeah, I'll take it. But then Boaz says, all right, but you need to know that Ruth, the Moabitess, comes with it. <laughs> so you acquire the land, you acquire Ruth as well. And she's the wife of the deceased man. And you've got to perpetuate the man's name on his property. Remember I said that's, that's what the, the law was back then. And so all of a sudden, this guy takes a total 180. And he's like, oh yeah, no, I can't redeem it myself. I'm going to ruin my own inheritance if I do that. So a hmm, little bit selfish there. Look at the stark contrast between Boaz and how he responded and how this other redeemer responded. This redeemer was like, oh no, this is going to ruin me. I'm not, I'm not doing that. 
I'm not going to even follow the law. I'm not, re I'm not doing it. So Boaz, and I'm, I'm just going to fill, fill it in for you. You know the rest of the story. Boaz takes her, is happy to take her. She's happy that he takes her and they have a son and 30 generations later, Jesus comes. Now that's all for the Bible reading, but I just have to tell you about all of the things that God has done, not only in my heart since this, but also um, the 20 revelations that he wanted me to share with you as well. So I think first what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read these 20 different revelations. Open your hearts and just let God soak deep inside for any of these that may feel like you. So when I read this in the Lord, it's not uncommon for people to say, uh, okay, Boaz is a representation of, of our Redeemer, Jesus, right? But what the Lord showed me is an and of that. And Boaz also represents the heart of our Father God, okay? So think about Boaz as Father God and just how unbelievably generous he was. Okay, so I'm going to go through these because I'm going to spell it out for you, each individual point. What, what sounds like you? Ruth lost her husband, okay? She lost her husband, her father-in-law, her brother-in-law, as well as her entire family she left behind when she chose to follow Naomi back to Judah. She probably wondered if she would have a future at all but God had a plan for her. You also may have had hardships or may be going through hardships right now. Maybe you have lost family members, income, health, whatever it is. But I want you to know that God has not left you without a future. He does have great plans for you that will in fact, flat out surprise you. Just like they surprised Ruth. Okay, here's number two. When Ruth had nothing left, she clung to Naomi. Remember that? Even telling her, your God's going to be my God. So is this you? God shows up in major ways when we give our lives over fully to him. It's from our place of nothingness. Remember, Ruth had nothing left. It's from that place of nothingness that God can rebuild us for his kingdom. So will you give your life fully over? Do you need to give your life fully over so you can receive him and the things that he has for you? Or maybe this one is you. Number three, Ruth was a foreigner in an enemy nation with no idea whether she would be accepted or treated as an outcast. But God sent people to her who accepted her and grafted her into their lives. And maybe you feel like a foreigner. Maybe you feel like um, you're out of place with God or in, you, you, I don't know, your circumstance, your geographic location, but you need to know God accepts you and he grafts you into his kingdom. You do not have to feel shame or guilt for your past or who you were affiliated with, period. He did not penalize Ruth that she was from Moab, not even one minute or instance. Or maybe this next one, Ruth had nothing left and probably thought there wasn't much to look forward to. She knew Naomi herself was incapable of supporting her, but God sent someone that gave her an exciting life that had already been established and respected in his community. And I'm not talking about marriage here, people. Maybe you feel like you have nothing left in your life to look forward to, but God can change your life in a matter of months or even days. He alone is capable of bringing exciting things into your life life. Do you believe it? Or this one, Ruth was in financial ruin. She had nothing left to her name, but God gave her opportunities to show off her servant heart and worth work ethic. And she found favor with a prominent special person. Are you in financial distress too? I mean, I can relate to that. God is faithful to provide. It might not be fancy. <laughs> it might take a lot of hard work, but God can bring you favor through others who recognize your hard work, your ethics, and your humble behavior. He can do it all day, every day. Or how about this one? Ruth probably felt a bit beat down and humiliated in life when she set out to Judah with Naomi, but God sent her people who did not humiliate her and instead gave to her generously. Okay. 
Does that sound like you? Are you feeling like you need God to lift up your chin and not humiliate you? Because he won't and he does not. God is not in the business of humiliating us. He is not. He will order his angels not to humiliate you. He can give to you generously when you're beat down and humiliated in life. Or this, Ruth might have been most definitely, or Ruth might have most definitely felt like she was in the wrong place at the wrong time <laughs> when they both arrived in Judah. I mean, there's nothing there for them, right? Gleaning in those fields was, was both embarrassing and hard. It was hard work. And God just happened to put her into the field of her future husband who did not turn her away from his field. If you feel like you're in the wrong place in the wrong time, God will happen, just happen to put you exactly where you need to be if you are willing to be humble and trust his path for you. He will not, God will not turn you away from his field. He will not. Ruth also might have felt like anyone would know, she might not have felt like, sorry, I'm reading this because I can't memorize all these 20 points. <laughs> Thank you for your grace. She might not have felt like anyone would have noticed her when she arrived in Judah. But her good reputation spread and resulted in giving her favor with a prominent person. Do you feel like no one ever notices you? God notices you. He created you and your life matters immensely to him. I'm gonna say that again. God notices you. Your life matters immensely to him. In your humble, consistent work, he can bring people who notice you and extend favor to you. Ruth was also in major need of protection, being a foreigner and a woman with no, you know, family protection when she arrived in that enemy territory and God provided protection for her from anyone who might have done her harm. Do you feel like you need protection right now from the enemy or from some kind of danger? Because God is your protector. And if you let him, he can keep you safe under his wings, just like he kept Ruth safe under his. Ruth might have also wondered day after day of gleaning if she was ever going to catch a break. <laughs> but God had precise timing for her to approach Boaz to be redeemed. So do you ever wonder if you're going to catch a break? Are you in that season? Like, when am I ever going to catch a break, God? God can move on people's hearts to help you. And God can send you who you need to advance into your future. He's not, the Bible says, he's not a respecter of persons. If he does these blessed things for Ruth, he will do them for his people. And here's another one. When, when Ruth arrived in Judah, she knew no one except Naomi and had left her entire family and friends back in Moab, as we remember. I'm going to guess that she was extremely lonely and lacking friends since she knew nobody. But God actually provided for her to work with Boaz's female ser servants for about three months. I mean, these were women who, who took her in, they accepted her, and I believe they probably developed really great close friendships. They're working side by side for three months in the field. So are you in a place where you've been wishing for friends? Or are you in a new place where you don't know anyone just like Ruth was? Because God can bring you into the right environments where you meet others like you who will look out for you and they will work alongside you and befriend you. Boaz offered Ruth much needed water from his own stores. We can only imagine how much of a welcome gift that was like I was mentioning for those hot, dry, arid days. So are you feeling like you're parched and you are thirsty for God? Because God wants to quench your soul, not only right now, but for the rest of eternity. God will let you drink from his well. Ruth's good character demonstrated in her decision to stick with Naomi was such an honorable thing that it spread throughout the town and resulted in great favor for her and Boaz spoke double blessings over her. So do you feel like you lack favor? God will allow your great character to be noticed among the right people 
You won't even have to tout yourself, okay? You don't have to talk yourself up. Ruth did not do that. She did not say, hey, look at what a great worker I am. <laughs> she never said that, actually. God's actually going to put people who good talk you, not bad talk you, right? He can put people in your path to good talk you behind your back. People will speak blessings over you for your good work, your humility, and your faithfulness. God sees your good deeds and will reward you, my child, he says. Also, Boaz comforted and encouraged Ruth. Do you remember that part of the story? Even though she wasn't like his female servants and she was a foreigner, well, God will be your comforter and your encourager, even though you might feel like an outcast sometimes and you feel like you don't belong. God is the greatest comforter and encourager there ever will be. And he takes pleasure in being that for you. Just like Boaz, we can only imagine, took so much pleasure being that and doing that and giving that to Ruth. Boaz offered also for Ruth to eat and dine at his table with his harvesters. And God can elevate you and ask you to dine at his table. A table you're not even qualified to be at. God will ask you to dine with him even if you're not worthy to. That's what God does. That's who God is. Boaz told his male servants to put out extra stocks from the bundles for Ruth. Remember that wasn't customary and instructed them not to humiliate her or rebuke her. And I just want you to know, God can work it out so you have extra as well. <laughs> he will not humiliate or rebuke you. That is not the business God is in. He is not in the business of rebuking and humiliating people. That is not his heart, you guys. And if you're broken right now and you believe it is, I want you to just receive his goodness. He is not humiliating you. He is not rebuking you. He cares for you deeply. He doesn't even rebuke you when you need to accept his charity. Ruth accepted the charity, right? And she did not get rebuked. He actually commanded his male servants, do not rebuke her. That is the picture of Father God who hands you something you don't deserve, gives to you something you don't deserve, and says, I'm not going to rebuke you. I'm showing you kindness and generosity. Ruth came to Boaz with literally nothing to offer when she went to his feet. Nothing. She had nothing. She had no dowry. She had nothing at all. But he accepted her and was eager to take her under his wing. You guys, we come to God with nothing. I know we think we're, we, you know, we got our faith. We got our Bible reading. We got our things. We got our devotion. No. No, the Bible makes it pretty clear. All that is a, like it's as filthy rags. We literally come to God, to Father God with nothing. Yet guess what he does? And he takes pleasure in doing, accepting us and redeeming us. That is what he wants for all of us. So Boaz felt Ruth was kind because, because Ruth chose him and no one else. And I'm going to tell you right now, God blesses you because you're choosing him and no one else. Because he knows you can choose other people, other doctrines, other ideologies. Did you know that God feels your kindness when you come and give him your life? And he takes pleasure in that. It's not just the other way around. God loves it. He, he feels like you're so kind when you choose him. Because he knows he's not the only one that can be chosen. What an unbelievable thing. He is so happy when we choose him. I just want that to sink into someone today. We're the ones usually thinking, I'm so happy I finally got to choose God. No, he's happy that you chose him, you picked him. He is so elated that you showed him kindness to say, I'm gonna put all my trust in you. My goodness, this is so good. God is so, so good. We have no idea the depths of his goodness. We just have no clue. But he's raining it down on us right now. Boaz would not rest until he settled the matter of redeeming Ruth. Guess what? God does not rest until he resolves things for you. He is always, always working on our behalf when we come to him and we give ourselves to him fully. When we lay at his feet like a servant and we say, cover us. He will not rest to work on our behalf. Do you believe that though? Do you believe that's the God we serve? I have one more for you. This is the 20th one. Boaz knew there was a redeemer closer than he was, but that redeemer declined to take on the responsibility. Well, what does God want us to know about that? 
that he is our only redeemer. There is no other. No one else can redeem you. Not one person, not one spiritual being. God is the only redeemer. There is none other. So take these revelations in your heart. I want to share with you just really briefly before we end um, what God did for me. Uh, I think it was about two weeks ago. And I have the most special gift that God has given me maybe in my whole life. And that is the friendship and spiritual partnership of Kaylee Whitebroat. And um, I'm going to start crying. Uh, she has been a friend and a minister to me. And a couple weeks ago, I was going through something extremely difficult. And I needed ministry. And God had already given me these revelations. And so we're talking, and I had shared these revelations with Kaylee as well. And um, it blessed us both. But in this moment, we're on the phone because we don't live in the same state. And Kaylee is ministering to me, ministering to my heart. And God says to me, Joanna, go lay down because I was sitting in a chair. He says, go lay down. Lay down like Ruth at my feet. Lay down as a servant at my feet. Because I had a broken understanding of my father's God, father God's love for me. I, it was completely broken, you guys. I could tell everybody else in the world how much God loves them, but I couldn't get it for me. I, I, j I don't know, there was a block. And God tells me on the phone, go lay down as Ruth did in her posture at my feet. And I'm telling you the moment I lay down and I'm like, Kaylee, I'm just warning you now. I'm laying down on the floor. <laughs> and the minute I lay down in what I thought was the same position Ruth lay down, which I chose the fetal position, the Holy Spirit came over me and I just started sobbing and he started healing these father wounds. And I mean, father God wounds that I had had where I had a misunderstanding of my father's love for me. And I lay there for a few minutes, you know, Kaylee's still ministering to me and the Holy Spirit's just ministering to me. And I'm going to tell you what, God has actually brought me into that posture a few more times since then when he is like, daughter, come to my feet, lay down at my feet. And is he asking you to come in humility, but also boldness? Did you know that Ruth had to be both humble and bold when she went to Boaz's feet? Humble because she was not entitled to a thing. Bold because she had to ask for it. She had to uncover his feet, be obedient to Naomi. So is God asking you right now, not in this moment, but maybe later on today, come to my feet, lay down at my feet. Let me lift up your chin. Let me accept you. Let me take on you as my full responsibility. Come to me. Come to me, honey. I want you. I want to redeem you forever, for all, for everything. Is God actually leading you to that? Because I'm telling you, if he is, answer him and do it. Don't worry if you feel silly. Go into a private room. I was just with my dogs. They thought I was trying to play with them when I was on the floor. It was hilarious. <laughs> but God wants you at his feet, humbly and boldly, to come to him and say, I want you to redeem me now. I want you to take me on. I want you to give me everything. I don't want to have to work in the fields anymore. Did you realize that? Did you realize that part of this, that Ruth never had to work the fields again? God is good. He wants to bless you tremendously. So, as scared as Ruth was, she was obedient. She was humble. She was bold. She was a servant first and foremost, which is what I seek to be. And so, is God luring to you to his feet to wait? Remember, Ruth had to wait, you guys. She had to wait, we don't know, a couple hours. God may say for certain things, I'm going to have you wait a couple weeks. I'm going to have you wait a couple days. I'm going to have you wait a couple years. But will we wait? in that same posture, no matter how much we're trembling with fear, will we wait patiently for his faithfulness? Will we? So I want to leave you with four questions. And I hope this just blesses you. As we seek to close here in just a minute, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray too, and I might even stay on, see if anybody needs ministry. But are you destitute? Are you destitute right now? Because so was Ruth. Can you not get yourself 
out of the bind that you're in. Because neither could Ruth. Are you poor and in lack? Because so was Ruth. Do you have nothing to give God except obedience and servanthood? Because that's exactly the same as Ruth. So Father God, I thank you. I thank you for these beautiful souls. I thank you that you care for each one more than they may ever understand until they arrive in heaven. I speak salvation over them if any of you want to give your heart over to God through Jesus Christ today. Just receive him. All you have to do is believe and receive. Receive Jesus. He will fill you with his Holy Spirit. And Father, I just pray that this message goes deep, 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 deep down into our souls, into our hearts, and that it does its healing work that you want it to do. And I speak of full work will be done for my friends and anyone that ever watches this broadcast, that they will have the same level of healing that anyone else has received on this call. This message is an eternal message, Jesus. Get it to the people who need it so desperately and fill them with the power of your loving Holy Spirit for the rest of their days. May they walk in freedom in Jesus' mighty name mighty name so if you need to go that's totally okay i'm going to stay on for just maybe a minute i want to see if the lord um wants anybody to be ministered to um i just i hadn't been able to look back through all the comments i thank you all so much for uh just for your comments and for being with me today you guys were such amazing encouragers behind the scenes um, thank you, Alicia. I agree. Call out the encouragers. Amen. The ones who would partner with us for our provision. Those who will talk good about us. Good talk behind our backs. He sets the lonely in family. Oh, yes, that's right. Loneliness is lo no longer a part of the family of Christ, is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. Amen. 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 God, I just pray that you show me if there's anyone here who needs any um, ministry. If you feel like you need any ministry, if you'd like me to pray specifically for you um, and you feel like you want to do that uh, over the live comment, I'm, I'm now looking at the comments. Um, and so if you do, um, let me know. Also, you are welcome to private message me. Um, private message me if you want. I'm happy, happy to pray. And I'm just so thankful that the Lord equipped me to get this message out. I love you guys. I love you, Alicia. I love you, Brandy. I love everyone that joined and everyone who will join. Okay, on that note, I just speak a blessing out over you like Boaz. Blessed Ruth, a full blessing from the Father, God in heaven who notices you and gives you everything you need through his redemptive power. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed.